Welcome to this brief podcast on what are human rights. I'm Professor Walters, and I'll be your guide through this very short overview designed to prompt more questions than answers. Our thought questions have no real right answers. What does it mean to be a human being? Are we mere organisms, the product of a long evolutionary process, responding to the forces of nature? Or is there something added that legitimates human rights above and beyond the rights of other animals? Why do we need international conventions, laws, and institutions to protect precisely the rights of women? These questions have no right or wrong answers. Convictions can be vigorous and unyielding, open and flexible, or vague and meek. Mostly they fall into two camps, at least according to Perry. Some believe that born human beings' sacrality is unquestionably religious, meaning endowed with something added that distinguishes human existence from other species. Human beingness is something not easily explained by biology or evolution, and no secular interpretation of the conviction that every human being is sacred truly makes sense, according to Perry. Others are passionately committed to purely secular views with deep cynicism of any explanations or definitions that touch on the supernatural. No serious sociology professor would suggest recommending religious cosmological or religious moral beliefs to anyone. I like Christian Smith's definition of what it means to be a human, per, a human being or a person. Persons emerge, a term used to describe the appearance of new levels with new properties, beginning with these primary capacity Inner, then secondary or inner subjective understanding, moving up to creative capacities and the highest order capacities which allow for interpersonal communication and love. Again, what is a person? Persons or human capacities engage self and other human beings and materials. They are socially preconditioned. A person is a conscious, reflexive, embodied, self-transcending center of subjective experience with durable identity and moral commitment and social communication. A person is the efficient cause of his or her own responsible actions. A person exercises complex capacities for agency and intersubjectivity in order to sus develop and sustain self in loving relationships with other personal selves and the non-personal world. It's good to be skeptical, even cynical, regarding to references, references to forms of reality not lending itself to empirical scientific inquiry. Nonetheless, it is also good, according to Perry, to wonder whether the idea of human rights isn't intrinsically religious. Can the idea of human dignity, preciousness, and sacredness be detached from religious beliefs and ideas, he asks. Can you produce a logically satisfying definition of human morality without reference to metaphysics, something outside experiential reality? Claims or echoing Nietzsche, napalming babies is bad, starving the poor, is bad. Buying and selling each other is depraved.
The purpose here is not to endorse or support religious ideas or beliefs, but rather to force inquiry during this first week, to force critical thinking that requires you to examine your own internal beliefs and consciousness. Knowing those and understanding those sets the parameters that allow us to move forward into a purely secular inquiry about international laws and constitutional laws that protect the rights of humans. What I'm asking you to think about and look at is what is it we are protecting? The final questions ask you to look at why do we need international conventions, laws, and institutions to precisely protect the rights of women? Here, that's the question and inquiry along with two others that shape the backbone, the core of SOS 381, CEDA, and the rights of women. The next question, or final question, regarding these international laws and institutions, do they work? And if so, how do they work?